Good morning, Victory Church. How you doing? Good morning. What a day it is to be here. My name is Troy. My wife, Darla, and I get the absolute privilege to pastor this church. And if you are visiting with us for the first time, or maybe it's your second time or third time, and you're still getting to know Victory Church, uh, let me tell you what we're about real quick. We're about four things here. We call them our four Gs, growing, guiding, giving, and going. We want to help people grow to know God. We want to help guide people to find freedom, help people give out of their purpose, and then go and make a difference. And so this month, the month of July, we're calling it I Love My City Month. And there's so many things we're doing. As you heard Pastor Brian refer to the 4th of July celebration, uh, this Friday, whoever signs up, we're going to go serve at the food bank during the morning time. If you're available, I know a lot of people work during that time, but if you're available, you happen to be a stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad or whatever the situation is, and your work allows you to go sign up, that'll be a great time. And then as Pastor Brian said, on Saturday, we are going to roll our sleeves up, and we are going to get to work here at this facility and a couple other areas, and we're just going to love our community. We want Smyrna, Tennessee to know that we're not just about inside the doors, but we are about our community. Another thing that we're doing specially we want to do is when you leave today, you're going to be handed one of these, and we're going to give you one of these every Sunday for the month of July. Don't take it and throw it away. Don't create a bookmark out of it. Here's what this is. It says something extra to show God loves you, and it's got information about V Kids and then the rest of the church on the back. This is an opportunity for you to do something for somebody this week randomly. Buy the person in the Starbucks line behind you's coffee. Give a little extra tip to the waiter or waitress. Do something special and then leave this card to tell them God was the one that caused you to do that because God loves them. We put this information because a lot of people want to know, well, does the church have something for my kids? Yes, we do. It's right here. It's beautiful. And so we're going to give you one of these, just one. We don't want you to take two. We don't want you to take three. We want you to take one this week and use it this week, and then next Sunday we will give you one more. And for the rest of the Sundays in July, we will randomly be showing people throughout our community love. Amen? Amen. Can you do that for me today? Can you grab this? And whether it be your waiter, your waitress, or whatever the situation might be, what in the world? Um, all right, that's interesting. So, hey, if you got your Bibles, open to the book of James, the book of James. Uh, it's towards the back of the book. We have been in this series, and we've been in it for a good while now. And what we've been doing is we've been taking this, this book of the Bible verse by verse by verse and applying it to our life. They say this is the most applicable book in the Bible to Christians on how to live your faith out, okay? Well, today, we are in the middle of this book. So we're in the second half of chapter 3, and over the next four weeks, we'll cover chapter 4 and chapter 5. And, and if you're just now jumping in with us, let me give you a little information. James, the gentleman who wrote the book that we're about to read, was the half-brother of Jesus, okay? So mother was his, or Mary was his mother, but God wasn't his father, okay? Joseph was his father, so he was the half-brother of Jesus. He went on to pastor a church in Jerusalem, and at the time that he writes this letter, the church in a whole across the world has been running and hiding because of persecution, and James writes out this letter mostly to Christians to say, hey, here's how we should act. You ever met a Christian that doesn't act like a Christian? That's a secret, yes. Um, and, and so James is kind of saying, hey, here's how we should act if we're going to be reflections of Christ. And so he wrote this letter. This was the Bible then. It's the Bible today. It just wasn't bound in leather. And he'd send it out. And the pastors that met in the houses, and they had little house churches kind of like this, they would, they would gather everybody and say, hey, gather around. And they would open up the letter from James. And then he'd read through the entire letter, and they were blessed by it. If we read the whole letter, it would take us about 20 minutes, and that's what the book of James is. It's been broken into about five chapters, uh, but we've been kind of taking it piece by piece, and what I'll do is I'll read a little bit all the way through so that we can see the context, and then I will take it verse by verse and how it applies to our life. Last week, we talked about our tongue and taming our tongue and how we speak and what we speak. So James was referring to what we say, the words that we speak, and you're going to see that this week he's talking about the words that we listen to. So first, it's the words that we speak. Today, it's the words that we listen to. So James chapter 3, we'll read verses 13 through 18. So if you have your Bible or you want to look it up on your phone or however it is that you read, here we go. He starts off, who is wise and understanding among you? In other words, who are you listening to? Right now, who gives you wisdom? 
When, when people talk and you take in those words and then you turn around and reiterate those words, who is it? Is it your great-grandma? Is it your grandma, your father, your brother, your boss, your sister, your pastor, your friend? Who's wise among you? Who are you listening to? Let them show it by then, whoop, that's cutting off. Uh, well, let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. And now watch this. Such wisdom, so James is introducing us to two kinds of wisdom. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. He went pretty, pretty serious right there. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, and sincere. For peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Lord, we thank you for this time together. I thank you for your word that is still alive today. I pray we'd make it applicable today to our lives and walk out of here better followers of you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Everybody is looking for knowledge today. Google says they get 40,000 searches per second. Per second, 40,000 searches. Everybody's looking for knowledge. Everybody wants to know more, know how this works. And what James is saying is this. When it comes to knowledge, when it comes to wisdom, there are two kinds. There's man's wisdom, and then there's God's wisdom. And it's, it's, it's different. They, they, they are very separate. And James doesn't want us to get caught up listening and having our life directed by the wrong wisdom. So he starts off by saying, first of all, who are you listening to? right? A lot of times you can tell if it's man's wisdom or God's wisdom just by who's saying it, right? And so who are you listening to? If you're getting all your wisdom from Facebook, you probably got a problem, okay? And so he's saying, who is wise among you, first of all? And then second of all, he goes even deeper to saying, sometimes the source isn't the problem. Sometimes you need a filter that is able to filter out man's wisdom versus God's wisdom, And so he starts teaching it this way, and he starts off, number one, with this. Here is what wisdom is not. Here's what God's wisdom is not, okay? Here's what it is not. Y'all got it? It's what it is not. Okay, Proverbs 2.6 says this. All wisdom comes from the Lord. All wisdom. All wisdom comes from the Lord, and so does common sense and understanding. So James says, if you have wisdom, you got it from the Lord. If somebody ever says, man, you're wise, you go, thank God. You didn't get it from yourself. You didn't get it from a textbook. If you have wisdom, you got it from God. And and better yet, if you you don't have, well, let me put it this way. You can't have wisdom if you are apart from the Lord. So if you have wisdom, you got it from God. And you can't have wisdom if you are apart from God. And here's why. Because knowledge comes from the world, but wisdom comes from God give you a, little, a couple of definitions. Knowledge is facts and ideas that we acquire through observation, research, and experience, right? So, so you got knowledge from school. You got knowledge from life experience. You got knowledge from research. That, that's what knowledge is. Wisdom is the ability to discern and judge which aspects of that knowledge is right, true, and lasting to your life. Let me give you some examples. Knowledge is knowing you need to buy a new car. Wisdom is knowing to buy a car that fits in your budget. Okay? Knowledge is knowing how to light a firework. Wisdom is making sure you don't spend the 4th of July in the emergency room. Right? There's a difference. Knowledge is knowing that your wife is wrong. Wisdom is knowing to shut your mouth. (laughs) See what I'm saying? Like, there's a difference. There's knowledge... And then there's wisdom. Amen. I just gave you marriage 101 right there. All right? Go buy some crumble cookies and have a nice marriage. Okay? And so, so it's just knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is information. Wisdom is how to discern that information. When Pastor Brian and I were in the youth group together, we kind of, after we graduated, we became youth sponsors. And uh, we, we, we always loved ministry, and we were known for being the guys that would always do whatever nobody else would do. Right? We were always those people. And you've met those people, and normally those people end up doing the worst things because no one else would do it. And so we, we were a part of all kinds of things. And one time the youth pastor came to us and said, I want you, I want to create this video segment 
that we'll do during like the announcement time, kind of pre-service to create laughs and a fun energy in the youth group. And we were like, okay. And so that was the popularity, the, the reality shows where people were hurting themselves. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That, that was going on big at the time. And so we kind of gleaned from that. And so we had some ideas. And one of our ideas one night or one day, the company that we worked for, we had a company truck. We worked for the same company. It's just so dangerous, y'all. Um, and so we, we, we left work or skipped work and went to the church in the company vehicle. And here was the plan. We tied a rope to the trailer hitch of the truck and ran it up. And he put on a pair of roller skates. And the plan was that he, he would hold the rope like he's skiing. And I would drive the truck in the church parking lot, which was really big. And I would go pretty fast. And then I would cut it left really hard. And there was this stack of wooden old school chairs. You know what I'm talking about? They have like the little desk part connected right here. And we just stacked them. And he had kind of a head camera. And I had a camera to the truck. And the plan was as I swung the truck, he would, he would let go of the rope. And real fast, he would be able to jump over the chairs and land. And woo, we did it, right? Knowledge. This is what we'll do. The truck turns at a 90-degree angle. The rope swings at speed, velocity. He goes. He jumps up. He's, he's got some ups. He jumps up. He lands. Ta-da! Knowledge. Wisdom would have said, don't do that. Because as we were going, I got a little bit of a lead foot. And so I'm going really fast. And I'm thinking, sell this, right? I mean, what's he going to do? He can't do anything now. He can't back out of it. And so I cut it really hard, and, and that caused him to go really fast. And Brian is really good about excellence. And so he was like, you know what? I'm going to sell this really well. So he decided last minute, he can tell you this, that instead of jumping over the chairs, it'd be way more entertaining just to bowl into the chairs, right? That's, he just he wanted to sell it. And so he, he bowls into the chairs, put a, a gash on his knee, and to this day, to this day, he can tell you when it's about to rain because he has pain in his knee. <laughs> I'm telling you, all for the Lord, right? All for the kingdom of God. Look, knowledge is knowing how to do that, right? Right? Put it like this. Knowledge is the know how to. Wisdom is the know not to. Okay? Right? So, so again, the knowledge you're getting, you're getting so much knowledge. You woke up today. You looked at your phone. You got knowledge. There's so much knowledge. But God says wisdom is discerning that knowledge. I love the way Billy Graham said it. He said, knowledge is horizontal. Wisdom is vertical. So, so knowledge is all around me, right? Knowledge is, what do you think? What do you think? What does that think? What does she think? Wisdom is, what does he think? Wisdom is horizontal while knowledge is, or, or I'm sorry, wisdom is vertical while knowledge is horizontal. And so, so James wanted us to make sure we didn't get these two things confused. He was really big on this. He said, listen, church folk, don't, don't get man's wisdom or knowledge confused with God's wisdom because one will get you killed, okay? One will give you life and one will get you killed. And so, again, he's not talking to unsaved people because to them, God's wisdom is foolishness. And so he's, not ta he's talking to Christians because to us, God's wisdom is supposed to make sense. And he says, hey, and watch this, verse 13, here's what he says. He says, if you harbor bitter envy, so there's, there's one description of you for, for knowledge. If you have bitter envy, knowledge will give you bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts. Don't boast, okay, and don't deny truth. So he gives some descriptions, but watch this. He goes, such wisdom, that wisdom I just described to you, which is, which is man's wisdom, does not come down from heaven. You don't get that kind of knowledge from heaven. And then he describes it in three ways. Watch this. But it is earthly, it is unspiritual, and it is demonic. So let's break this down. First, he says it's earthly, okay? Here's what that means. It means wisdom according to world standards, okay? So, so it's the wisdom you're getting on a daily basis. It's earthly. It's not heavenly. It's earthly. So what you learned in high school, that's earthly knowledge, right? It's just what you're learning. It's what you learned today when you opened up the news app and read. It's earthly knowledge. It's not from heaven. It's just earthly knowledge. Here's the thing about earthly knowledge is it changes, right? The things you thought you knew when you were in high school, some of them aren't even true today. When I was in high school, Pluto was a planet, people. <laughs> How are you just going to do Pluto like that? You know what I mean? Like, you can't just walk out and say orange isn't a color anymore. Like, that's just wrong. And so, again, you know, I mean, I, and I've also, how about this one? I've heard that the earth is flat, right? Remember when people believed that, right? And then we disproved that, and now people still think that, right? Because it's just, it's just constantly changing. People used to think you could see the Great Wall of China from space. And then we found out you can't because earthly not. People used to think Crocs were fashionable, 
Sorry. If you wear Crocs, sorry. Uh, Dallas. And so, um, and so, you know, they just think, they think it's fashion. You know, it just changes. Knowledge is just constantly changing. What we know today, we won't know tomorrow. It's just, it's constantly, you know, people are discovering things and, and they're, they're revealing things and we're constantly learning. Earthly knowledge is just changing. Earthly knowledge to you may be one thing and to you may be another thing. It's, it's earthly. It's not from heaven. It's earthly. The other thing he said, he called it unspiritual. Here's what that means. Sensual. It's knowledge that feeds your flesh. It's not spirit knowledge, it's flesh knowledge, okay? It's the thing, watch this, you choose to believe because it feels good to you, right? Come on, we've all had it. We've, we, number one, we've all done it. Number two, we all know people who do it, right? This, this is truth. No, it's not truth. You just really like doing that or you really like saying that or you really like that person or you really like going there. Let me tell you the best example for it is when I was youth pastor, and teenagers would get in relationships, and they would come to me and go, I'm in love. I go, you don't even, you know, you are not in love. You, you, you like the feelings you have. And so that's truth to you. Here's how I knew they weren't in love. Because six months later, they would break up, and guess what? They were in love with somebody else, right? Right? They were in, oh, no, this person I'm in love with. Like, good, this is the 20th person, so hopefully you found them by now. It's sensual. That, that, that's, what, that's what man's wisdom is. If, if I like it, it's true. You know, it, it, one of the ways that I think is really funny about this is what's health right now, the health knowledge right now. Like, like, it's so all over the place. Some people, it's like, I only eat meat and I'm healthy. And then some people are like, I don't eat meat and I'm healthy. And I'm like, I'm confused. I don't know which one it is. At the end of the day, do we even know? Like, or is it just what our senses, what, what, what we like, what our tastes are? Is it information? Is it back to the earthly information where we're getting new information and things are changing? You see what I mean? It's just constantly all over the place. And then he calls it demonic. And here's what demonic means. It's not God-focused, it's self-focused. It's the same wisdom that the devil used when he decided to take over heaven and got kicked out. That's the kind of wisdom James is referring to. <laughs> it's not very wise. It's information on how you can do it, but it's self-driven. Most of the knowledge today is self-driven. And James says, hey, we got to know the difference between God's wisdom and man's wisdom. And here's what I'm learning about man's wisdom. Man's wisdom often leaves us unsure and confused, right? Have you ever seen somebody, and I do this all the time, because there are things that I like. Let's just take sports, for example. I'll get into a debate with sports with somebody, and I'll go into it with, with, with a complete understanding of what I'm about to say. And by the time they're done talking, I'm like, I believe you more than I believe me. Like, I think you're, you know what I mean? Because it's just that constant debate back and forth, and, and it just sometimes it leaves me unsure and confused. And so I wanted to show you this picture of this road, and I wanted to illustrate this for you because I, I think it's very interesting for you to know. Look at every one of these roads as one of those things James said. Look at one road as, as an unspiritual, look at one road as earthly, and look at one road as demonic. And so when we get knowledge, you know, it's going one way, and then all of a sudden we get new information, so it goes back another way, and then all of a sudden our senses feel something, and so it goes back another way, and that knowledge or truth for us is all over the place because we felt one way this day and we felt another way tomorrow, right? If our knowledge is dictated by our senses, then it depends on what side of the bed I wake up in the morning is what I believe. Or if it's earthly, what are they going to discover tomorrow that's going to give me new information? And so at the end of the day, it's just confusing. And it's why you have a culture today that doesn't know what it believes. They have no idea. Because one minute they're here, and the next minute they're there, and somebody said this, and somebody said that, and most people's belief system looks like this. They're lost. They have no idea. And they are starving for somebody with real wisdom to come into their life and help them. And we're going to address that in point two, but... but let me show you a verse that I think is so powerful in how to fix this, okay? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You've heard it before, but I want to make you see it a different way. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding, okay? Let me phrase it like this. Trust God's wisdom and quit found, uh, uh, building your life on the foundation of man's wisdom. I love how it said, do not lean on your understanding. You, you ever leaned on somebody before? 
right? So, so imagine if, if, if Ed, Ed, stand up for me real quick. Everybody look at Ed. See, this is a monster of a man. You see him? Like, like <laughs> right now the abominable snowman is nowhere to be found because he's here, okay? And so if I, lean on, if I leaned on Ed, don't you think I'd have a little bit more confidence as I lean on Ed, right? Y'all think, would y'all have confidence leaning on Ed? Yes. Okay. All right. You can sit down, sir. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, um, let's see. Crystal, will you stand up for me real quick, ma'am? I'm sorry. All right. This is Crystal. Chris, ain't she beautiful, y'all? She's so beautiful. And she serves on the worship team, and she got a voice, and she's in growth track, and her husband's Paul, and I want to be him, and all these kind of, they have beautiful kids. Anyway, but I, I have less faith in leaning on Crystal. N- not, not because, because Crystal's strong, but I'm kind of a big boy. And so you see how there's, there's more faith here than there might be there. Does that make sense? I didn't offend you, did I? You're still beautiful. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for it. I just need an example. Uh, and so, so here's my point to that. Here's what, here's what Proverbs is saying. If you're going to lean on something, don't lean on your wisdom where you might not have full faith in. Lean on the wisdom of God that you are confident in that it's going to be able to hold you up. If you're going to build your life on something, don't build your life on something that's this way one day and that way the next, right? Don't build your life on something that goes with your senses. Because if it goes with your senses, it all depends on if she breaks up with you or if they fire you, and now your belief system is all shifted. He says, build your life not on your own understanding, but on the wisdom of God. And then watch this. In all your ways, submit to him. What does it say? He'll make your path straight. So all of that confusion disappears, and it goes from multiple roads going all different places to one road that knows where it's going. I am not all over the place. I am about this. Here's how I feel about God. Um, I know I'm not wrong, but if I am, I'll take my chances. I'd rather get to heaven and be like, oh, we were just supposed to live and die? Okay, my bad. Here's what I always like to say to people about our church. You give me one year. You come to this church for one year, you get involved in everything. You serve, you go to small groups, and at the end of the year, you don't like this church, I'll leave with you because I know you're going to like it. That's that kind of confidence, you know what I mean? And I have the same kind of confidence in God. Like, I'm going to lean on him, and when I do that, all of these focuses leave, and I'm focused on a path that is straight. And so James is saying, hey, 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 this is what wisdom is not, right? Don't lean on earthly wisdom. Don't lean on sensual wisdom. Don't lean on demonic or selfish wisdom. Lean on God's wisdom. And then he says, and this is what God's wisdom is. So I just taught you what God's, what, what, what God's wisdom is not. Now let me teach you what God's wisdom is. James 3, verse 17 and 18. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. It's peace-loving. It's considerate, it's submissive, it's full of mercy, it's good fruit, it's impartial, and it's sincere. And peacemakers who sow in peace, so those who sow in God's wisdom, reap a harvest of righteousness. So James does a great job of showing us what wisdom is not. It's earthly, it's unspiritual, it's demonic, and he does even a better job of showing us what wisdom is. And I'm going to break this down a little bit. The first thing he says is he says it's pure. It says God's wisdom is pure. And here's, here's the situation, okay? Uh, wisdom starts with being pure because it's God. It's not polluted wisdom. Our wisdom's polluted because some of the stuff we hear is true and some of it's not. I, I listen to any, any of y'all sports people, I listen to like six sportscasters tell me Kawhi Leonard is not going to the L.A. Clippers. They said he might go to other places, but he's not going to the L.A. Clippers. Guess where he went? The L.A. Clippers, okay? And so that, here was that show you. It's, that it's just polluted. There's some truth in there and there's some lies in there. It's polluted. But the wisdom of God is pure because it's from God. The next thing it says, it says it's peace-loving. I love this. God's wisdom brings peace in the room. When, when God walks in the room, peace. You wanna, you, here's the best explanation of, of the opposite of this is go on Facebook and watch how many people get in arguments over Facebook, Right? And then you'll always catch that individual who gets in the conversation just to start stuff. You know what I'm talking about? They come in like, I think she's ugly too. You know what I mean? It's just, and it just takes off. Like they're just trying to find ways to, to make fights go. And, and, and James says, God's wisdom enters in the room. Watch this. Enters in the room and says, how can I make peace of this situation? That's powerful. 
when you have the wisdom of God, you don't walk in a situation looking to cause fights. Here, here's, here's, the, here's the temptation. I don't mean that God's wisdom isn't confident in what it believes, but it's so confident in what it believes that it steps in with peace. Can I give you an example of it? I was talking to somebody yeah, Friday, I think, and we were talking about black belts and people who do karate and all that. And, when, and I, I made this comment, didn't realize I made it. I said, isn't it funny how the people who know how to fight never go trying to start a fight? You ever notice that? Like people who know how to fight, like Jimmy and Red, they, they don't come into places, that's an inside joke, but they don't come into places looking to start a fight because they know they can mess everybody else up in the room. You know what I mean? People who have black belts, they're, they're, they, they, are, they are there to, to create peace because they know they have confidence in their heart. God says when you have confidence of who he is, you don't step into a room trying to cause trouble. You step into a room going, how are we going to create peace? How are we going to get peace in here? Look what it said in Proverbs 20, 11, but the wise bring calm in the end. They bring calm. What do the wise do? They bring calm. If you find yourself at work or at school and you're trying to create strife and you're trying to create problems, you're operating in man's wisdom. God's wisdom says, how do I create peace in here? It's powerful. Next, he says, be considerate. Wisdom is gentle when dealing with others. It's considerate. Wisdom says this, hey, I've been through it too. I, I, I know you might have done something wrong, but guess what? I've done something wrong too. I know you might have sinned, but guess what? I sinned too. And so wisdom is considerate. Wisdom comes in and says, hey, I don't know your story, and I'm not going to pretend to know your story. So wisdom tells me to be considerate. I don't walk in the room slandering and throwing things. I walk into the room considerate of those who are around me. It's considerate. Look what the Bible says, 1023. But a person of understanding delights in wisdom. A person of understanding. I, every meeting I try to have, I sit down and the first thing I do is I let the person I'm meeting with talk because I want to understand what happened. Because I'm considerate to the fact that I may not have the right story and maybe they're right in the long run. So I'm a person of understanding. Next, he says that wisdom is submissive. Submissive. Listen to others' opinion. Wisdom listens to others' opinions and it's open to correction. I love this so much because I think this is where Christians struggle the most. This is where humans struggle the most. It's because we think when we get corrected that someone is attacking us. Wise people get corrected and say, thank you. Thank you. Because guess what? Now I'm going to be better. Correction is never, I you did a series the whole time called Love Correction. Right? Just love it. Just, you just need to love it. You need to, you need to want it. Correct me. I mean, me and Darla have this agreement where we can be together and I can just go, how are we doing? Do I need to do better? Correct me, because if you don't correct me, I don't know, and so I keep on moving, doing dumb things. <laughs> but if you correct me, I can stop. Uh, you don't even know this, but about three or four weeks ago, we invited an individual and his wife to come to church just to correct us. He is involved in a church planting organization. He helps with church plants, and I, I met him through Malcolm. And he goes, man, y'all are a little bit further along. Normally we consult with new church planners. And I said, hey, do me a favor. You're in the church plant world. You and your wife, come to church, enjoy church. Write down everything that we do wrong. Write down everything that we need to do better. Just take notes of it, and then I'll take you to lunch, and you can tell me everything that we do bad. Can, deal? And he's like, okay. And so he comes to church, and, and they did, she, that whole sermon, she wrote three pages of notes from the sermon, not from the correction. Back off me. Um, but... <laughs> They love church. We met, we was talking in the hallway, and, and he, I'll never forget this. He said, man, I didn't write down much. He said, y'all are doing a lot of great things. And I said, that's fine. I want to hear what you said. So this past Friday, I met him for lunch, and I want to say right off the bat, he went through, started off, he only had a few things that I've already fixed in the past to our directors to fix, but he said so many good things about our church. He bragged about the parking lot team and how welcoming he is. He bragged about the signage. He bragged about the worship team. He bragged about the whole production. He bragged about the kids' ministry. He bragged about all the greeters and every as he walked in. He bragged about the people. He bragged about it. He bragged, he bragged, and finally I told him, I said, look, quit talking and start correcting. <laughs> I didn't buy you lunch so you could brag about me. I need you to correct, you know, do something, correct me. And he starts going through this list, and, and like I said, we're already working on it, but he said something at the end of lunch that I'll never forget. He said, Troy, you're already steps and bounds ahead of most pastors and church planners. And I said, why? He said, because they are so prideful, they don't want to listen to correction. And I thought, man, don't ever let me be that. Correct me. Wisdom says, correct me, because then I can get better, and I can be stronger, and I don't have to keep dealing with these things I'm dealing with, right? Correct me. I, I'll tell you one correction he gave, and I'm, I'm busting this out. And was, one of the things he said is he said, the TV that's right here, he said, if people in close to this aisle want to come down for prayer, they got to worry about tripping on the TV to come down to prayer. I said, that's so wise. We're going to fix that. You know what I mean? It's just, I would have never thought about that. It's just correction, the power of correction, so 
God's wisdom is submissive. Proverbs 13, 10, wisdom is found in those who take advice. Take advice. It's also full of mercy. Wisdom is moved by the needs of others. God's wisdom wants to help other people. And if you remember, James talked all about this with our faith, not just being faith, but having works and not just wanting them to eat, but giving them food. And goes on to say in Ecclesiastes, words from the mouth of the wise are gracious, gracious. It's also impartial. James talked about this earlier, that wisdom, God's wisdom does not show favoritism, does not show favoritism. God's wisdom does not say, I like you better than I like them. And I love this verse uh, in Proverbs right here, 3-7. Be not wise in your own eyes. Listen to this. God's wisdom is not even showing favoritism to you. In other words, don't see yourself as wise. See yourself as wanting to become wise. If you think you know everything, let me tell you something. You're wrong. Okay? If you think you're the best at it, you're wrong. There's somebody better than you. Wise says, I'm not the best. I want to be the best. Right? Right? And then uh, sincere, wisdom is not a show, it comes from a heart that wants to please God. Proverbs 19, 8, the one who gets wisdom loves life. So God's wisdom isn't about me. God's wisdom isn't about me showing off. God's wisdom is about God. And so James lays out all these things about the wisdom of God. And as I read them, <clears throat> I got this thing in my head, and I want to quote it from what I wrote, because I don't want to misquote it, but you might have to go back and look at it later because it's packed full. But as I read the things that wisdom of God gives us, here's, here's, here's what I walked away from. Man's wisdom leads us to do what we are able to do from knowledge, while God's wisdom leads us to do what we are only able to do from the Holy Spirit. So, so man's wisdom, I learn. I can change a tire because I learn. So, so man's wisdom allows me to do what I can only do from my knowledge, but the wisdom of God, I can only do it from the Holy Spirit. So where do we begin? How, how do we even start with wisdom, right? Proverbs 9, 10 says this, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How do you start getting wisdom? You have to fear God. You go, oh, there it is. I knew this church was too cool. They're going to tell me. I'm not telling you to be scared of God. That's not what this means. It means to put some respect on his name. You know what I mean? It means to have all of God. It means to honor him. It means when you understand that God is God, that's the beginning of you valuing his wisdom. You know, it's so funny. I, I hang out with church people all the time, church pastors all the time, and you'll watch. Somebody will walk in, and they'll have, and I'll be with another pastor. He'll have no interest in that person until they go, oh, man, that guy's church is 3,000 people. And then they go, oh, I want to meet him. It's like, but you didn't want to meet him before. Right? So, some, something shifted. Something happened. And that's not the best illustration, but it gives you an idea of something happened in the knowledge of that person to make them now value their wisdom. And so there's a point where you begin to fear God. You begin to honor God. You begin to respect God. You begin to, to be in awe of God, and you want his wisdom. God gave me the worst way to illustrate this ever, and it happened a couple days ago, and I'm going to share it with you. Please don't think I'm a horrible parent. I tried my best, but, man, it was horrible. Um. Darla was gone, of course. That's how every story starts. And so she was out doing something. And, and me and the girls were traveling somewhere. We were in the car, and we're driving. And I'm in the front seat driving. And Casey Ray, for those of you that are visiting, Casey Ray is my four-year-old. She is hilarious. Veda is my nine-year-old. She's a genius. And so they're just they, together. They are fire and oil and water, however that is. Um, and so we're driving in the car, and we're going somewhere. And I look in my rearview mirror, and Veda is playing with the seat belt like she's going to wrap it around her neck. And so I said, hey, baby, don't do that. Here's why I knew to tell her not to do that. Because when I was young, I didn't like to sleep. You ever slept in the car and, like, your head fall? You know what I'm talking about? So I would wrap the seatbelt around my head, and it would hold my head up. And my dad knew it, so he would slam on the brakes, and it would, like, lock me in. And so I was like, just, let's not do this. And so I was trying to tell her, and she was like, okay, Dad. So I gave her knowledge. Don't do it, right? You're going to break your neck. Like I did the whole parent thing. Like the whole world's going to end. Don't do it. And we're driving, and, and she didn't listen. And so uh, just a few minutes later, I look back, and she's like, Dad. And she's got the seatbelt wrapped around her neck. And she's like, I can't get out. Now, she wasn't choking, luckily, or I would have really panicked. But she was scared. She, she couldn't get out. And so I, I, I thought that it was probably no big deal. I could get out of the car and just, you know, pull her a little bit and help her get out, and we'd be done. So I pulled over at the closest gas station. Casey Ray's in there. I jump out, go to the door, open it up. And what she had done is she had, before she tied it, she had pulled it and made it lock. You know what I'm talking about? And then she put it around her neck, and then it went in. 
So, like, there was no give to it whatsoever. Like, I, I tried to get her to stand. I tried to get her to lay down. I was trying to do everything I could, and there was, it was no way. And she wasn't choking, but now she started to panic because she thought she was never going to get out of it, right? And so now she's like, she's just crying. Dad, Dad, am I going to get out of here? And I'm like, yes, yes. And so I run to the gas station. I'm like, do you have a pair of scissors? And he's like, no. And I'm like, where's your cheapest knife? And so I bought this little pocket knife. If you need a pocket knife, I got one, you can have it. And I run out to the car and I cut the seatbelt off and I unfold it and she had this red mark on her neck and she's crying. And she's like, dad, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. And I'm like, baby, it's okay. It's okay. Scared me to death. And so we get in the car and we keep on driving to our state and Casey Ray out of nowhere goes, I bet she won't do that again. <laughs> I'm like, no, she won't. Because one's knowledge, I told her it was going to happen, y'all, but that's just knowledge. She gained wisdom when she had the fear of it, when all of a sudden she respected that seatbelt, right? She was like, that thing don't play no games. And there's just that moment where we begin to fall in the awe of God and the respect of God and the honor of God where we go, hey, hey, hey. I need that wisdom because I've been in both worlds and this world don't play no games, right? I need, I need this wisdom. So James says, this is what wisdom is not. It's not earthly. It's not unspiritual. It's not demonic. Wisdom is all of these things, pure, peace-loving, uh, submissive, all these things. And it begins, it starts, the beginning level is the fear of God. So then last but not least, how do we get it? How do you and I get wisdom? James said in Chapter 1, if you were here, the very first lesson of this series in verse 5, he said, uh, if any of you lack wisdom, you should just ask God. You should just ask God. And watch this. He gives it generously and all without finding fault. Here's what that means. If you're in here today and you're recapping the life you've lived or you know that you have not followed God or you don't even, maybe you're agnostic, maybe you don't even believe in God. And, you, and because of that, you say, I can't get wisdom. God's saying, if you ask me for it, I'll give it to you generously without finding fault. You ask for it and I'll give it to you. But look what I did. You asked for it, and I'll give it to you. But, but, you asked for it, and I give it. I didn't graduate. If you ask for it, I'll give it. It doesn't matter if you're a theologian. It doesn't matter. If you ask for it, I will give it to you, and it will give you life. The other day, I was walking through Sam's, and I saw this device, and so I had to ask Mr. Chris Swanner about it because Chris is like our MacGyver, okay? He's the church's MacGyver. And so I saw this, and I thought it was, I didn't know if it was real, and so I asked him about it, and he had one. It's called a life straw. Y'all ever heard of this? So the life straw, uh, what happens is there's a filter right here in the bottom, and you, the whole point is that you can stick it into polluted water. If you were out on a trip and you dying of thirst, and you sip through this little straw part, and you get fresh water from it, right? And, and, and so, again, you would put it in this bottle, and then you would drink it. So this is an example of polluted water, and this little filter, as it comes in, it's way more polluted than I thought they were going to pollute it. Uh, uh, if, um, if this goes wrong today, uh, Tim, you're the new pastor. And so... Um, this little filter does it. And so I started thinking about this, and God dropped this illustration in my heart. He said, you know what? This is knowledge. You know why this is knowledge? Because there's good and there's bad in here. Everything that you're going you're gonna to take on in the world, there's, there's good and there's bad. Your, your, your phone that's dinging news right now, there's good and there's bad. There's, there's a lesson that tells you don't go swim with alligators because somebody got eaten by an alligator, right? That's good knowledge. And then there's information about the Kardashians, which is not going to help you at all. And so there, there's polluted, like there's good, and there's, it's polluted. There's, there's knowledge. There's, I, I need some of this, but, but I, need something, I, I need something to help me discern what's coming. And so that's why wisdom is the filter, right? So when you ask God, how? Through his word, through prayer, give me wisdom. And as it comes through, you ready? Let's try this. Let's see if this works. This doesn't work. Uh, baby, it's been a great 12 years, and I pray for you with them girls. All right. Actually, pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. Just wanted to prove to y'all it was real. Now watch this. I said, what in the world is he doing? 
Okay, I just wanted to show you the ability to take something that you should never consume, and as long as you run it through a planned filter, it gives me life, right? So, so the knowledge that's out in the world that's coming your way from your friends and your family and from the textbooks and all that, like some of it's good, some of it gives you life, but some of it's going to give you death. And what James is saying is you need a filter. What's my filter? Your filter is the Word of God. Your filter is prayer. Your filter is the ability to just ask God, God, give me wisdom. I don't know what to do. Should I take this job or not? Should I marry this person or not? Should I go there or not? Should I read this or not? Should I watch that or not? I need wisdom. God says, if you ask me, I will give it to you. And when it comes through the filter of God, now whatever lasts gives you life. And so it's all around you. You just need the right filter. And I thank James so much for helping us see that where there's good wisdom, there's bad, and where there's bad, there's good. And if I'm going to be able to exist in both and walk away with life, there's another verse in the Bible that says that you don't turn your back on wisdom. Because wisdom gives you life. And Van, I want to invite you up real quick. This is kind of a surprise to you. But as I was praying and getting ready to come up here, I just felt the Spirit of God tell me, you're going to pray today and then you're going to make a declaration in worship. We're going to do it through that song, Build My Life. Andrea just about slain me on the front row when she was singing the chorus of that song. I don't know if y'all remember the song I'm talking about. And I thought, man, what, what a testimony for us to say, God, I will build my life. I will build my life on you. And so if, if, you'll, if you'll do this for me, I'm going to ask you to stand. Don't do it yet, but in a second, I'm going to ask you to stand. And we are going to just ask God for wisdom. We're going to do what the Bible says. And you can do it however you want to do it. You can lift your hands. You can leave your hands by your side. You can talk out loud. You can talk inside. You can do whatever. But here's what you, here, if nothing else, say this. God, can I have wisdom? If you don't want to say any more than that, it's fine. Just, just that's what the Bible says. Ask. If you want to get more elaborate, then by all means. And then I'm going to be praying over you. And then when I say amen, they're going to lead us into that chorus part of, I will build my life. Can't sing. Obviously, we know this. Um, and, and I just want you to declare it. I just want you to say it. God, I'm going to build my life on the wisdom of God. Not the wisdom of man, but the wisdom of God. Can we do that this morning? Are you okay with that? Would you stand with me real quick? And if you'll just close your eyes. Just so, no, for no other reason but so that you can remove the distractions that are around you. Like I said, you do this however you want to do it. But I'm going to begin to pray. And I'm just praying over you as you pray. You say and pray however you want to pray, but you are asking God for wisdom. Hey, there are mamas in here that need wisdom on how to raise their kids. There are daddies in here that need wisdom on how to raise their kids. There are, are couples in here that need wisdom on how to be a good married couple. There are single people in here who need wisdom on who to pick for, to be their spouse. Or better yet, wisdom on how to live without one. You're in here, you've you got college decisions, work decisions, financial decisions, ex-wives, ex-husbands. you got blended homes. you got all kinds of stuff going on. And guess what? Tomorrow's Monday. And we're giving you another choice. You're going to walk out of here and you have to choose between pineapple and strawberries. Isn't that horrible? So many decisions. You need wisdom. I'm just telling you, you need it because there's a lot of information coming your way polluted and you need to be able to get out of it what God wants you to get out of it. So I'm going to begin to pray and you begin to pray yourself. Lord, we come to you right now in the most humble of ways. And Lord, standing on your word that says if we want wisdom, James said, just ask for it. Ask for it. And then you said you give it generously. Lord, I know, I know what that means. I know what it means to give above and beyond. You don't just give us wisdom for one situation, but you give us wisdom for every situation. God, you give us more wisdom than we even need. You are so generous, and it doesn't matter who we are, where we are in life. It doesn't matter if we've been going to church for 40 years or if this is the first time we've ever stepped foot in something called a church. It doesn't matter if we're Christian or non-Christian. It doesn't matter. You give us wisdom. You give us wisdom because we ask and Lord, when you gave me that illustration and looking at this dirty water and the idea of how dirty the knowledge is today, God, there's a filter. You've given us a filter. 
your word, prayer, to be able to get out of that the nutrients and the wisdom we need so that we can have life. And so God, your children right now just coming to you, broken before you, saying we don't know how. I don't know how to raise my kids. I don't know how to love my wife. I don't know how to work my job. I don't know how to see my dream come to me, God. I don't know how to have great friends at 34. I don't know how to be able to mentor people. I don't know how to handle blended families. I, I don't know all these things, but God, if I ask you for wisdom, you'll give it to me, Lord. And so today we're asking that, Jesus. And I pray that you hear our prayers. And then, Lord, we are going to agree with our prayers as we sing and declare that it's on your wisdom that we build our lives. Thank you for your word that is alive. It was ministering to the church in the, in, the, in the Bible days, and it's ministering to us today. It's alive. It's moving in our lives. It's working in our lives. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.